So we were talking about the workflow. And again, I'm showing you this once again, since you already have seen it, because I want you to have in mind that we have two branches in the max quant. One, it has to do with um, the theoretical uh, spectra, so the theoretical branch, and one is the experimental branch that has to do with experimental spectra. So we already saw the experimental branch, uh, and now we're going to see the theoretical branch. And why we're actually having theoretical branch, uh, it's because we are going to use uh, the prior information of a database of a list of proteins that we expect to have in our sample. And this will help us to identify the peptides easier. How it will help us, let's see. So again, as I said, uh, that uh, we have our sample and usually we uh, are aware of the organism that the sample came from. And based on this information, we will go to any protein database, for example, in Uniprot, and we will download uh, the uh, protein uh, database for this organism. Uh, so we will download it in a FASTA file. Uh, so the FASTA file will contain a list of proteins that uh, we expect to have uh, in this organism. Uh, then, uh, so now, from now on, all the steps that we are going to do, of course, they're going to be in silico, but they should be uh, the equivalent of the steps that we did in the wet lab. So for example, now I have the list of the proteins in the FASTA file, and I am going to digest them into peptides. I'm not going to digest it as I want, but I'm going to keep the same digestion rules of the digestion enzyme that I used in the wet lab for my experiment. So for example, if I use trypsin uh, in my wet uh, lab experiment, then I have to do uh, the same digestion in silico. So I will like uh, digest the proteins after uh, lysine and arginine. And then after the in silico digestion, then from a list of proteins, I will have a very, very big list of peptides, uh, as we can see here. And so of course, it's so one of the peptides will have a mass uh, a comp uh, as a company. Uh, so then, uh, so you have to understand that this list is very big, very, very big. Uh, we have a very big list of peptides. And uh, uh, what we will do, since uh, from the MS1 uh, level information, we know the peptide that we actually isolated to do the MSMS fragmentation, we can use this information to go from this very big list of peptides to a smaller list of peptides that, uh, that um, actually are the candidates for that RNA identification. So, um, uh, yes, again, I know that I, I isolated this peptide with a specific M over Z. I also know the charge, so I can infer the mass of the peptide that I isolated. And based on this mass, I will be able to only get out of this big list of peptides only the uh, actual candidates. Of course, with some like tolerance, so I will not only get one peptide, but I will have like a list of peptides. And then for each one of these peptides, the candidate peptides, I'm going to create a theoretical spectrum. Uh, so I will end up with a list of theoretical spectra here. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to compare uh, every time one, uh, the, our experimental MSMS spectrum with the, one of the theoretical MSMS spectrum. And I will um, uh, score it using the Andromeda uh, search engine that we have in MaxQuant. And this score will give me like a confidence about how good the matching between the experimental spectrum and the theoretical spectrum, how confident we are about this matching. And we will see exactly uh, the um, uh, Andromeda scoring later. Uh, and uh, since I have a list of peptides that I'm going to do the Andromeda scoring uh, with, uh, only one will win. And that's how we will infer the peptide from the theoretical spectrum that won to the experimental spectrum. 
but uh, this is uh, uh, quite uh, like a very simplified view uh, because we don't just take the experimental spectra, we don't just create the theoretical spectra, we have specific rules of uh, pre-processing, for example, the experimental spectra. So let's see how this will work. So yeah, let's talk about the experimental spectra and how we process them. So processing of experimental MSMS spectra in max quant. So first of all, max quant should be aware of your spectra in the first place. And to do that, you have to load your raw files that you got from your mass spectrometer into max quant. We will have, again, tutorials about that. But in general, you just load the raw files into max quant. And now uh, max quant is aware of them. So we will, it will be able to go and search for the spectra in the raw files. Uh, and uh, let's say that the raw MSMS spectra look something like that. Actually, it, this is not uh, a realistic view of this uh, MSMS spectrum at all. But what I'm trying to do here is that you should be aware that uh, the MSMS spectrum is quite populated with peaks. That's what I'm trying to say here. But not, it's not realistic at all of how the MSMS spectrum looks like. But so it's very populated with peaks because we have a lot of noise, for example. We can have like co peptide uh, fragment peaks. So we want to go from this uh, very populated MSMS spectrum to something filtered, where you only keep the peaks that actually are important for the peptide identification that you want to do. Uh, so how we are going to go from the raw one to the filtered one, we have a list of uh, steps. So let's see the steps one by one. So the first thing that we are doing is uh, called centroid centroiding. So what actually that means? Uh, so when you run the mass spectrometer, sometimes you can uh, collect the data in two different modes. It can be either centro uh, in centroid mode or in profile mode. Sometimes actually uh, the mass spectrometer only gives you one option, but you can do um, you can have uh, the raw files in uh, profile or in centroid mode. So when you load the files into uh, MaxQuant, MaxQuant, the first thing it will do, it will uh, uh, change the profile mode to centroid mode. Of course, if the raw files that MaxQuant got, they were already in centroid mode, of course, it will not do it. Uh, so again, first step is we're going to do centroiding. The second step is we're going to do de-isotoping. So uh, as I said uh, before, and a lot of times, uh, is that uh, one peptide will probably come into an isotope pattern in your spectrum. Uh, so, but uh, you understand uh, that all of these peaks from an isotope pattern uh, correspond to one peptide. So it's more or less like you, you have redundant information, let's say. So what we want to do, we want to collapse all of, all of these peaks from one isotope pattern to only one peak. But we are going to do it after we got the, all the information that we want. Because as we said before, the isotopic pattern actually gives us a lot of information. And one of impor very important information is the charge. So of course, we're gonna look at the isotope uh, pattern. We're gonna get the information that is important for us, for example, the charge. And then we're going to collapse the isotope pattern in only one peak. How we're gonna do that? we're going only to keep the location of the peak that corresponds to the monoisotopic peak from the isotope pattern, uh, which is the first peak uh, in one isotope pattern. And the height of the peak is going to be the sum of the heights of the peaks that you have in your isotope pattern. So as you can see here, here you have two isotope patterns, and then you're gonna, after the isotoping, we're gonna have only two peaks, one for each one of the isotope patterns. Let's go to the next step. Step. So the next step is that we're going to collapse uh, the charge state, all the charge states to charge one. So uh, the same peptide can have it, it can happen that you have it in your data in different charge states. So for example, here you have the same peptide in charge one and charge two. So what we're going to do, we're only going, to, again, this is redundant, redundant information as far as the identification is concerned. So what we're going to do, we're only going to keep one peak for each peptide. And it's going to be the charge one peak. So the location is going to be the charge one 
location. And then the height of the peak that we're going to keep is going to be the sum of the heights of all of the charges that we show in our data for this specific peptide. So as you can see here again, we had one peptide with charge one and charge two. But then at the end, we kept only the location of the charge one. And then the height, uh, we used the sum of the heights of the different charge states. Hey, I have two questions regarding the uh, collapsing charge state step. So the first question is, if that's the case, then does that mean Maxcon will never report any fragment ion in the MS2 that has charge state not as one? So it will not report anything, it, say, have two it, charge state. It will report it. I probably, I uh, like... Um, say it like in a way that it was like confusing to you but what i mean even let's say that you have one peptide that is only in charge two in your data then of course we will keep we will keep this information but we will put it in charge one position so we don't like throw it away because we didn't so we didn't see the charge one uh, peak so we just put everything in charge one so we will just move it another question is does the collapsing charge state step also apply to potential precursor ion in the in the MS2 spectrum as well? No, this is only for the MSMS spectra. Okay, I see. Thank you. No problem. Because also there, I guess uh, you will um, uh, it will also have effects on the quantification. But this is only for the quantification, and this is only for the MSMS spectra, not for the MS1. So yeah, let's continue. So we are in the stage where we are processing in MaxQuant the experimental MSMS spectrum. And we said like three uh, steps already. So we are doing centroiding, the isotoping, and collapsing the charge states. So we already like our MSMS better look not that much populated. And still we keep the important information uh, for the identification. But still uh, it's quite uh, um uh, populated because, for example, we didn't do anything about the noise. So we have to do something about that. And then there is another step in Max Quant where we are going to process the MSMS spectrum, spectrum by filter the top Q peaks per 100 Dalton window. So what does this mean? So we have um, all of these uh, peaks in the, our spectrum. Uh, but we don't know which peak is actually a noise peak and which peak is actually a fragment ion peak. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to have like a window of 100 Dalton and we're going to slide it through the whole range of M over Z of the MSMS spectrum. And then for each one of the window, uh, of these windows, we are going to only keep the Q most abundant peaks. Actually, yeah, let's say th this is the window of 100 uh, Dalton. And then we're going to keep the Q most abandoned peaks uh, features. Yeah, peaks. Uh, uh, so this Q number uh, is not only one number. It's the maximum number that this Q variable can have. So for example, let's say that uh, we give um, uh, the Q number Q number equals 20. So we will start with Q equals 20. We will go to Q equals, we will filter the spectrum. Then we will continue with Q equals 19. We will filter the spectrum, so on and so forth until Q equals four. So let's see uh, an example. So let's say for Q equals four, we have like this window and we will slide it and we will keep every time that we slide it only the four uh, most abundant peaks. And then we do it for all of the windows locations. And then at the end, we're going to have a filter version of the initial experimental MSMS spectrum. And of course, this is only for Q equals four, but then you have to do it once again for Q equals five, then for Q equals six until Q equals 20, because your Q number is 20. So then what, what does this mean? If you have Q equals 20, then one experimental MSMS spectrum will give you 17 different MSMS spectra that you are going to use to do the Andromeda scoring. Uh, so now we are going to deal with the theoretical branch. So here we have the theoretical spectra. So let's see how we're going to process them or how actually we're going to create them. Uh, 
see how we are going to create the theoretical MS spectra. So first of all, uh, Max Kwan also should be aware of uh, your FASTA file to create the theoretical spectra. So you are going to load the FASTA file by going to the global parameters under sequences, and you're just going to load it there. Again, we're going to have great tutorials tomorrow to see exactly what you need to do. Uh, so now Max Quan is aware of the FASTA file, uh, which means it's aware of the list of proteins. So it needs to do in silico digestion with exactly the same digestion enzyme that you used in your experiment. And then uh, it's going to create all the fragment X. But let's remember how the fragments um, are created when you fragment a peptide. So Max Quan will use this information to create the theoretical spectra. Here I have an example of a small peptide with three amino acids. And in red, you see uh, the bond that is in between the amino acids that it's called a peptide bond. Uh, and uh, But this is not the only bond that you can fragment when you fragment a peptide. You actually have other bonds in the uh, peptide backbone that they can fragment. Uh, here, I color them with uh, blue and uh, green. Any of these three different colored bonds they can fragment. Uh, and depending on which one you fragment, you will have a different ion. If you uh, the peptide fragment is going to have the N terminus, uh, then you're going to create A, B, and C ions. And if it, uh, your fragment is going to have the carboxyl group, then you're going to have X, Y, and Z ions. So, uh, but also, Maskan uh, will use the information about how the different fragmentation methods used uh, to fragment the peptides, and each one of these fragmentation methods have different uh, probabilities of which bonds are fragmented. So, let's see an example of uh, CID and HCD fragmentation, and how uh, which uh, peaks uh, the Maskan will provide to the theoretical spectra. So CID is uh, abbreviation for uh, collision-induced dissociation and HCD for high-energy collision-induced dissociation. So when you fragment the peptides with this um, type of fragmentation, you expect uh, uh, the uh, peptide bond to be fragmented. So you mostly expect to have B and Y ions. So that's why Maxpan also will provide all the B and all the Y ions of the peptide, and so it will provide the A2 ion. Uh, all of these are charge one. It makes sense why it provides Y and B ions, but maybe you are confused about why it also provides the A2 ion. Uh, and it will provide it because uh, with, uh, with this fragmentation, you usually see a very prominent B2 ion in your spectrum. And this B2 ion also, uh, it can fragment further uh, with um, like an exclusion of um, a mon a carbon a monoxide and it will create a very prominent A2 ion peak. And that's why we also provide it here. Then what else we provide? We provide a B and Y ion, but double charge. Uh, and uh, maybe this uh, is, um, it creates some questions why we do provide this, because when we were processing the experimental spectra, we saw that um, we uh, collapse all the charge state to, to charge one. So it doesn't really make sense for Max Kahn to provide in the theoretical spectra charge two peaks. But why we're doing that? This, there is a reason why we're doing it. Because um, if you remember, we said that one peptide uh, doesn't mean one peak. But sometimes what happens is that you cannot resolve the whole isotope pattern for a peptide. You only see one peak. And for these peaks, you actually, because you don't see the isotope pattern, you cannot resolve the charge state. Because again, if you don't, uh, to remind you, the charge state comes from the distance between consecutive peaks in the isotope pattern. So now from these orphan peaks, you actually don't know the charge state. So it can be charge one, charge two, charge three, so any charge. For this reason, we also provide for these actually orphan peaks, we provide also charge two B and Y ions. Oh, I mean, of course, it makes sense only to provide them when charge of the procursor is more than or equal to two because, I mean, if it's one, it's not possible. Then, of course, if the peptide contains a modification then, and it will create diagnostic peaks, then we will also provide that. And then we are going to provide also some neutral losses. So until now, I showed that um, 
uh, the bones that they are fragmented uh, when uh, at the backbone of the peptide, but also what can happen is that you can have a fragment on the side chains of um, the amino acids. And when you do, uh, when you fragment at this, um, at the side chains, then you can have neutral losses. Uh, so we provide some of these neutral losses that um, uh, usually you see in the experimental spectra. So one of these is the uh, water losses. So we will provide the B and Y uh, neutral losses, uh, and we will provide them only if the fragment actually contains one of these four amino acids, because this is when you usually see these neutral losses in the experimental spectra as well. Another neutral loss that we will uh, provide is the uh, ammonia losses. So again, Y and B ions with ammonia loss, and this is also we will provide it when the peptide, uh, the fragment actually contains one of these four amino acids. Um, and then we have, if uh, the fragment contains a modification, then we will also provide modification specific neutral losses. And uh, so we will provide for CAD and HCD, we will provide this list of um, uh, fragment peaks. And uh, for each one of the theoretical peptide, we will create two uh, theoretical spectra. One without providing the neutral losses and one with providing the neutral losses. And again, uh, the best Andromeda score will win at the end when you calculate the Andromeda score with experimental spectrum. So yeah, we finished with uh, filtering experimental spectra, but also we created all the theoretical spectra from our uh, FASTA uh, database. And now it's time to do the Andromeda uh, scoring. Again, you have to understand that every time that I'm talking about calculating the Andromeda score, I mean between one experimental spectrum and one theoretical spectrum. And what I mean by comparing these two spectra to calculate the Andromeda score is what you're doing is actually more or less, you put one on top of each other, you actually align them uh, based on the M over Z axis, and then you just count how many of the peaks are matching. Of course, this has to do also with some mass tolerance. By uh, matching one experimental spectrum with one theoretical spectrum, you're gonna have two numbers that they are important for the Andromeda calculation. One number is the N, which is the total number of the, the theoretical ions. The other number that's quite important is the K, which is the number of matching ions in the spectrum. So now that you have these two numbers, you're ready to calculate the Andromeda score. Uh, we're gonna go step by step of how the Andromeda score, to understand how the Andromeda score is calculated, but this is not the Andromeda score. So first let's say that we want to calculate uh, the probability of getting exactly K matches by chance. So how we are going to calculate that? Uh, this is like the formula. So first we're gonna calculate the um, combinations. So again, N and K are the two numbers that I talked about before. So uh, yeah, N chooses K, which means the combinations of um, uh, creating K matches uh, from N theoretical um, peaks. Then we're going to have to multiply it with the probability of a random match, which is the Q divided by 100. And here the Q is the Q number that we talked about before. And 100 is the window that we talked about before. And you raise this probability to the number of matches, which is the K. And then you multiply it with uh, the probability of not getting a random match, which is one minus Q divided by 100. And again, you have to raise that probability again to the number of not matches, which is n minus k. So, but uh, we not really care about getting exact, uh, to get the prob to calculate the probability of getting exactly k matches. We mostly care about the prob to calculate the probability of getting at least k matches. Yes, so you add up all of these probabilities from j equals k to n. And this is the probability of getting at least k matches by chance. And now we're getting closer to uh, what the Andromeda score uh, is. So then you will get this um, probability of getting at, le uh, at least k matches and you're going to logarithmize it. And then you're gonna take the minus 10 of this value. And this is going to be the Andromeda score. 
uh, yeah, why we're doing the minus 10 thing is that even if we didn't have the minus 10, so usually when you have a score that uh, gives you a measure of how confident you are about uh, a match, uh, you usually want the bigger the score, the most confident you are. But uh, if you see the probability of getting at least K uh, matches, uh, the lower the you're most con the more confident you are. So we want to change that, and that's why we multiply with minus ten. So yeah, so best score wins. But what about false positives? Yeah, andromeda scoring is a great way to show you like how how confident you are about um, a comparison between two spectra. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it can also uh, make some errors. So you have uh, to have a way to uh, filter out these false positives. Uh, and uh, the way that we are actually uh, doing it is the most widely used uh, way um, of doing it in protomics, which is the um, target decoy database. Uh, so what I mean by that, probably you have heard about it, but let's go through it. So until now, uh, you saw that we created the theoretical spectra by using a FASTA file that we got from a Uniprot, for example, from the organism of the sum uh, that we have in our sample. Now what we are going to do, we're going to take this uh, FASTA file and we're going to create um, a nonsense, uh, let's say, FASTA file by inverting all of the uh, protein sequences. Uh, so why we're doing that. So first of all, when I say revert, I mean reverse, like you get the protein and you reverse it. And that's your nonsense, nonsense uh, new protein. So this, uh, so we call like the proper database, we call it target and uh, the nonsense database, we call it decoy. And this, both of the data sets, they have the same, like uh, they're the same size. Uh, reverting the um, proteins is only one way that you can do uh, you can create your decoy database, but uh, and this is the way that we suggest you to do it. But of course, there are other ways as well. You can, for example, randomize uh, your amino acids and your proteins. Um, one uh, rule that we have um, uh, when you create decoy databases is that it shouldn't be easy for you to understand when you see a protein uh, or a peptide uh, to be able to understand if it comes from a decoy database or not. And what I mean by that is that uh, in a protein, uh, the amino acids are not ra in random places. So uh, amino acids have a specific probability to be next to a specific other amino acids. Uh, so when uh, I'm reverting the protein uh, sequences, I'm actually not changing these probabilities. But if I'm actually going to randomize the amino acids, then I'm going to change these probabilities. So from randomized decoy database, I get the proteins. And if I do some statistics there, I can easily be able to understand that this is a decoy database. The suggestion from us is that you should do a revert the proteins to create the decoy database. And also I have to remind you that this, you don't have, it, you don't have to do it beforehand in MaxQuant. You just, in, what you need to do is that you just put your FASTA file in MaxQuant and MaxQuant will do it for you. So, but actually there is a parameter in MaxQuant that you can change how a decoy database will be created. And default by default is uh, by reversing the proteins. So I'm, uh, so again, we had the target database, we created a decoy database. And now we also, we are going to use the same steps that we saw before to create also theoretical spectra from the decoy database as well. And we're going to use both uh, theoretical spectra, both from target and, and decoy uh, database to do the Andromeda scoring. And again, the best Andromeda score will win. The main assumption uh, underlying like this uh, process is that uh, the false positives have the similar likelihood to come from the target uh, database or the decoy database. So just by counting how many of your experimental spectra match to the decoy uh, theoretical spectra, you can um, infer, let's say, the proportion of the false positives in your target uh, database. So when a, an experimental spectrum will actually match with the best Andromeda score to a, tar, uh, to a decoy uh, theoretical spectra, of course, we know that this is wrong. So this is not going to be at the end in your uh, results. 
but we're going to use this information to infer the proportion of false positives in our actually theoretical pattern that they're coming from the target database. You will see later in a later step, like uh, how we actually, like let's say, calculate uh, the proportion of false positives in our uh, table. So now uh, that uh, we learned some stuff about how Max Quan, uh, we learned some Max Quan basics, let's say, it will be nice to put everything into perspective. So when you have everything ready in Max Quan and you press run, there is a list of steps that go one, one after the other. It's not the full workflow. There are a lot of uh, more steps uh, when you press run in Max Quan that will happen, but this is the most relevant to this presentation and yeah, the most important, I guess, for you to understand how Max Quan works. So yes, let's start with the first step. So when you press run, the first thing that uh, Max Quan will do is that it will do the feature detection. So let's see what actually this means. So feature detection, so Max Quan will go to the MS1 level landscape, which lo will look something like that. Uh, so in this landscape, you have three dimensions. At least you have three dimensions. You have M over Z, you have intensity, and you have a retention time. Of course, you can have more. So let's say that you have ion mobility data, and you can have another dimension as well, so four dimensions. Uh, but let's stay with this um, uh, figure, um, this cartoon. Uh, so you have three dimensions here. So Max1 will go there and it will see all of these peaks. And somehow it, it should start gaining more and more information about these peaks. Uh, because until now you only have these three dimensions and nothing more. One step uh, that it will try to do is that it will be nice if we know which peaks, which group of peaks correspond to one peptide. So uh, it will try to do that. So we will try to go from here to here. Now, uh, just by the color, uh, Max Quan will know, for example, that all like uh, the peaks that are uh, green, they correspond to one peptide. We don't know which peptide because still we didn't do any identification so far, but at least it's enough information to start with. We know that all of the green uh, peaks that correspond to one peptide, all of the blue ones to another peptide and all of the red ones, the pink ones to another peptide. So how are we going to do that though? We're going to do that with the 3D feature of detection. Uh, so if you zoom in in one part of this 3D landscape, uh, it will look something like that. So again, here you have three dimensions and you will see something like that. You will see a lot of peaks going up and down uh, through retention time. And what we want to do, we want to create these rectangulars at the base of the of these peaks. So you can see here we have rectangulars like with different colors. And uh, that's what we will try to do when we want to um, find the 3D uh, features. Now we're going to go from 3D to 2D. So we're going to remove the retention time. And how we're going to remove it, we're going to slice the retention time. So for example, first we're going to take this slice and then we're going to take the next slice and we're going to have a series of steps in these 2D plots now. So, um, Yes, again, we have the 3D and we're going to 2D by slicing the retention time. The 2D plus will look something like that. And this is the profile mode. And we say that uh, uh, Maxman will do the, um, the profile mode to centroid mode. So how we actually do it, it's actually very easy. You go and find the um, local maximum uh, and then you go down until the intensity goes, uh, goes down to zero. And then you will have these two red lines. Max Quan will put these two red lines, as you can see here. It either goes back to zero or it goes down and then back again, which we call solder, like here. And again, it will put a red line here. And these red lines are like the borders of the 3D feature. So first we're doing this. We find the borders of the 3D peak. And then we are going to find where we should put the centroid. Uh, so for the location of the centroid, we will find it by taking the five most abundant peaks inside this uh, like red uh, borders, and we're going to logarithmize them, and then we're going to fit like an inverted parabola. It doesn't matter that much, So, but this is how you are going to find the location of the centroid. Then the height of the centroid is going to be the sum of the heights 
of all of the peaks inside the red uh, borders of the 2D profile uh, plot peak. Uh, so now I have two things. I have the borders, the red lines, and I have the centroid. And now, and I have that for one slice of the retention time. And I'm going to do that for all of the slice until the end of the retention time range. Uh, and now I'm going to put, so I went from 3D to 2D, and now I'm going to put all the uh, 2D centroids and red lines together in 3D uh, again. Uh, and now I'm going to group together centroids. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go from one MS scan to the next one, and I'm going to see if uh, the difference of the centroids in the M over Z axis is less than 7 ppm, then I'm going to group these centroids together. And then I'm going to go to the next to next scan, and then I'm going to do the same calculation. Sometimes I'll go to the next scan and there is nothing there. Uh, we will allow this to happen because sometimes this happens. We don't have like, um, um, the signal is not like um, big enough. So maybe it happens that you don't have uh, like a centroid in one scan. So what MaxScan will do, it will go to the next to next scan. So after you group all of the centroids, and then you will have the 3D feature. So it will look something like that. These are the same plots, but one is like in 3D and the other is in 2D, but you're just looking at it from the top and the color uh, shows the third dimension, which is the intensity. And the green means like high intensity and the yellow means low intensity. What I want you to see here is actually like um, the border line uh, here around the 3D feature, which is actually the red lines that we saw and created here. And this is the rectangular that we wanted to create to find the 3D features. So uh, it's actually not a rectangular, as you can tell. It's like it has more of an irregular shape. But this is actually uh, very good. It's for our, our own advantage because it's more accurate. And uh, let's say if you had like um, uh, like two 3D features very close to each other, because of this very um, pre precise like um, borders, you will be able like to distinguish between them, which is great. Another thing that I want you to see is like the line in, uh, in the middle, like here. And these are the centroids. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can see that they're going a little bit wiggly. I mean, it would be nice if it, there was a straight line, but with any machine that measures something, you have like this variation. So yeah, so this is the centroids. So yes, so now we found the 3D features. So now what we are going to do, as we said a lot of times, one peptide doesn't mean one peak, also it doesn't mean one 3D feature. Uh, so now you have to put uh, the 3D features together. So, um, how we're we going to do that? Uh, so we ha we have to have some rules. So we have three different rules, three main criteria to put 3D features together in one isotope pattern. So the first thing is that the distance between consecutive 3D features should be uh, almost one over Z. The second criteria, uh, the second rule is that um, the intensity pattern uh, at the M over Z axis of the isotope pattern should correlate with the intensity uh, pattern of uh, uh, the averaging model of a peptide of the same mass of the of this M over Z. So if you're not aware, there is um, like an average model. So since so we have this 3D, uh, 3D peaks. Uh, and we try to put everything together in an isotope pattern, but we still don't, uh, we haven't done the identification of the peptide. We only know that the M over Z of the monoisotopic, let's say, of the isotope pattern. Uh, so what we can do is that we can, uh, since like um, all the peptides are not the same, but very similar, and they uh, are created by the same uh, amino acids, we can use like uh, the average peptide of an M over Z of this isotope pattern. And we do that by using the average model. So the intensity profile of this um, isotope pattern and uh, what we get from the average model should correlate 
So we, what we are going to do, we're going to calculate, we're going to calculate the cosine similarity, and then we're going to put a threshold on it. So the second uh, rule is this. And the third rule is that, and it's the most important one, is that the elution profile in the retention time axis uh, should correlate. So these are the three criteria. And if um, it passes all the criteria, then you can actually group together all of these 3D features in one isotope pattern. Yeah, so now we, uh, we saw the three uh, main criteria to put 3D features in one isotope pattern. But uh, also uh, what you may have in your data is that you can also have some MS1 labels. So when you expect like, um, uh, like multiple uh, isotope patterns that correspond to the same peptide. For example, let's say that you have a SILAC with light and heavy uh, labels. Uh, so you will have like two isotope patterns that correspond to the same peptide, one in a light form and one in the heavy form, and you should put them together because they correspond to the same peptide. And again, to group the two isotopic patterns now together, you have to have another three main criteria. Um, first of all, the mass difference between the monoisotopic peaks between the heavy and the light should be a fixed set of values divided by its charge. So, um, for example, let's say that uh, you use, as I said before, uh, the, the silac. So you used heavy lysine and heavy arginine. So, of, of course, this difference that I'm talking about, it has to do a lot with what uh, digestion enzyme you used and also what labels you used. So let's say that you use a uh, triptych digestion. So all the peptides have not all of the peptides, but most of the peptides have one arginine or one lysine, mm -hmm. uh, then you would expect this um, distance between the monoisotopic peaks uh, of the different isotope patterns to be either 8, which is the heavy lysine, divided by the charge, or 10, which is the heavy uh, arginine, divided by charge. Of course, you have some exceptions here. So you can have, for example, peptides that uh, they don't even have the heavy or the light, depending, they don't, you can deal with peptides that actually are C-terminus, for example, so they don't have uh, any lysine or arginine, uh, or you can have like uh, peptides that uh, they have miscleavages, so you expect also these uh, cases. So for example, you can have uh, a peptide with two lysines or two arginines, two heavy lysines or two heavy arginines, or one li heavy lysine and one heavy arginine. So you have to take that all of these cases into consideration when you're measuring the distance between the monoisotopic peaks. The second rule is um, that again uh, the isotope pattern and uh, the, um, the isotope intensity pattern between the different isotope patterns should be um, uh, should correlate uh, with each other. And the third, the third rule is that also they have to correlate in irritation time. Uh, and also I said, including little shifts, uh, including the deuterium shifts, I don't, I, did, I don't think I mentioned it before, but what Max Plan does, it will take the one uh, azoto pattern and will move it in the retention time, uh, like uh, three scans uh, up and down, and it will um, calculate the correlation, the cosine correlation with any of these like changes in the retention time and the best one will be used. And we do that because when you have the deuterium, then you have some changes in the retention time. So that's why. And uh, if all of these uh, criteria um, um, pass through, then of course you can put the light and the heavy isotope patterns together uh, in a pair. Uh, 